Welcome to Good Humans Podcast, John Winning Jr., or as I like to call you and a lot of your friends, Herman. How you going, mate? Yeah, good, mate. Yeah, and very well. Cheers, good. It's great to be here, having you on my podcast. You've been somebody who I've wanted to ask to come on my podcast for a very long time, but I've kind of not been scared, but I'm like, I know you're a pretty private guy sometimes, but you also went on Mark Burris's podcast recently. And I was like, I'm going to hit up Herman and say, let's have a chat. Because, yeah, it's my pleasure. We'll do it anytime. Man, well, um, the first question I... Maybe I, that's a good one for you that you should ask. Yeah, don't, don't hesitate. Just ha action, you know. Just, I, if you'd asked me two years ago, I would have done it. No yeah, problems. but I didn't have the numbers two years ago. I'm good. It's good now because we've got something special to talk about at the end of this episode. But cool. first, we're going to talk about your story because it's crazy and super interesting, I believe anyway. It's super inspiring as well. So the first question I am going to ask you, though, is what are you grateful for right now? What am I grateful for? I'm grateful for the team around me that are helping out um, with humankind because in my life I'm very good at having big ideas and I've worked out that I need amazing people around me to execute those things. I'm, You know, one person can only do so much and I know that when I'm uh, working by myself I can achieve a lot, but... When I'm working with a bigger team, you can achieve, you know, 100 times or you know, 10x, 100x, 1,000x, uh, as long as that team's aligned and believes in what you're doing. So I'm really grateful for the team that I've got around me, the love and support from, you know, team members at work, you know, new friends like Jack Manning Bancroft from AIM and, you know, new friends like Dan Single and, you know, Canon Raja and all these people that have kind of come in and, and banded together to go we got you, like, this is, it's going to be good because in this particular instance that we'll talk about later, you know, it really what my initial idea for the event was, it's just grown sort of, I would say legs, but it's more like tentacles <laughs> in every direction and all of a sudden we're going deep into the arts and deep into, like, science and deep into business and deep into mentoring and deep into wellness and, all, you know, and just because of the calibre of the people that we had, it, it just had to go so deep into you know you couldn't just have the top 0.1 percent as like the Wim Hofs or the Jim Jeffries without having them supported by amazing people at that sort of next level um in in the arts or the fields that they play in and so mm. it's just grown into a massive snowball effect yeah. of like whoa what have we taken on and we're going to catch back up to what humankind is make sure you keep listening to this episode but first I want to get to know your story a bit more because I'm sure people are like what the hell who is this guy so maybe real quickly how do you describe what you do um, oh, you do a lot. I, yeah, I, I, I'm a risk taker that loves to fail and loves to find out where my boundaries are. And I find that that's the best way of knowing where your limits are. And it's, you know, my dad always taught me in business, you know, take risk but never risk at all. And so I probably get much closer to that than I believe probably he would be comfortable with in, in terms of like his time in running a business and Certainly skydiving and a few other things, I you know, get a bit closer than a lot of people around me that are more cautious. But then I quickly get scared and go, well, that, that was too close. We need to back off for a few months and then I slowly work my way back into it. Like I have a motorbike license, for example, but I'm too scared to buy a motorbike. <laughs> I'll borrow them, but then I scare myself on my friend's bikes. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. you definitely should not you, own you a motorbike. I'm too much of a daredevil. Oh, uh, well, we're going to catch up to a bunch of your story. But first, I want to rewind a little bit. My podcast is a bit unique. And I want to get to know the story, which catches up to the amazing stuff you are doing today. So just sort of quickly, what was your upbringing like? How was life as a kid? And then sort of going into high school from what you can remember? Um, yeah, well, I was yeah very fortunate to be brought up in a great area in Sydney. You know, certainly our family wasn't poor. We lived in a, you know, a very... Um, good area in Vaucluse and then Watson's Bay. Uh, I was brought up in a family that was probably, you know, a little bit of love from my mum but still plenty of discipline from mum and pretty much felt like mostly discipline from dad, although I'm sure there was a lot of love behind the scenes, although he's never really shown it to me. I think it was more just, you know, he felt that was just how he was brought up and that's how he should bring me up. And so that's kind of yeah really kind of pushed me into like a rebellious nature as a human being and I know through school I just was the class clown I had no interest in learning anything I was almost like oh okay you're going to discipline me I'm going to push the boundaries in that direction and so that's kind of probably helped shape who I am today and it's probably counterintuitive to what they were trying to achieve with, with all the discipline but they were never pushing me to be book smart you know my dad sort of 
very early on said, you know, I want you to make the connections through going to a private school and specifically he wanted me to be at a GPS school because in his mind he said, I'm not so worried about you learning what's in the textbooks but I want you to be around people that are a good influence on your life. Mm. And I think that, you know, he said from his uh, generation that he saw more benefit in the network that you get from being in those environments was much stronger than the education that you get. And so never really pushed me to do homework, but he certainly pushed me to not get in trouble for not doing homework. So he said either work out how to do the work or work out how to get out of doing the work. But he said, I don't want to be called into school for you not doing the work because then you're wasting my time. And if, if that happened, then I'd get a flogging here. <laughs> Interesting. I think that's really cool. And I think that's a, something I'm sure you probably look back at and are very grateful for that now the life you live is all about networking. It's all about putting teams around you to succeed and to create the opportunities that you've obviously created now. So coming towards the ends of your high school years, what did you think your life was going to look like post school? What were your dreams? What were your aspirations? Where did you think post school was going to go for you? I really had no idea. I mean, at one point I thought I'd be a photographer because it seemed like that was a pretty cool lifestyle and you get to take photos of, you know, beautiful nature or beautiful items or beautiful, you know, men Models. or women or whatever, you know, like it was sort of like, okay, I'm either going to be shooting cool cars, cool locations, cool holiday destinations, cool nature shots, cool action sports or cool people or, you know, beautiful people or whatever it was. Like It was sort of seemed like, oh, this seems like a life, you know, and I never really wanted to amass an amount of wealth or anything and so for me I was like pho photographer seemed like a pretty cruisy lifestyle but then I never really loved being behind the camera I, you know, I had a few cameras and my auntie's a um, professional photographer and so she got me into it a little bit and I was like it's actually pretty boring you know <laughs> like, <laughs> I need I a bit more of a challenge yeah and so then it was I just really had no idea the only thing I knew was I was definitely not going to university I didn't love school that much and my dad said because I stuffed around so much during school that there was no way he was going to accept that, you know, I was going to say that I wanted to go to university because he said if you didn't take school seriously, you're not going to convince me you're going to take university seriously. So he wanted me to get a trade and, you know, in some respects I did get a trade in my definition, not in his definition. He was thinking like builder, electrician, you know, carpenter, that plumber, that kind of thing, whereas I ended up... Uh, by accident ended up being a door-to-door -door salesman and that kind of is a trade in itself in the lifestyle that I live and, w and what I do. Oh absolutely selling is like one of the skills that you don't learn at all, all at school and then once you get out into the real world especially me owning a business now and you obviously having many successful businesses learning to sell is one of the most important things you can do so give me a story about when you were a door-to-door salesman how did you get into that? Um, well, I got into it because I, my dad was like, you've got to apply for something now. I was already working at a restaurant uh, around the corner from where I live called Doyle's. I was just running tables because my dad was like, you're going to be working before you leave school. So through my HSC, I was doing that. I was doing my coxswain's ticket for driving like water taxis and ferries and uh, commercial charter vessels. But it wasn't what I wanted to do, obviously, long term. And I thought, oh, marketing could be fun. So I was just going through the paper like any kid probably would going look at the job ads, and it was like this direct marketing ad. And I never forget, it was direct marketing. I'm like, that sounds all right. I've got no qualifications, so maybe I'll just put a suit and tie on and go to an interview and see if I get it. And I went there, and it was straight away, the interview was like, yep, yeah, um, you're basically teamed up with this person. The guy's name was Vincent. And it was like, you're going out with Vincent today. You, you know, your interview's going to be on the road. You're going to follow him, see what he does, and then, you know, he'll give you some questions, and we'll see if you've got what it takes. So I went out there and I was like, this is the weirdest job interview I've ever done in my <laughs> life. I'm on a train. I'm going, you know, out to like Parramatta or Penrith or somewhere and knocking on doors and just basically walking around. I was like, this is weird marketing. What were you selling? Uh, like Video Easy and Domino's Pizza Vouchers. So no. it was like... <laughs> Those little books that you used to get. I was like $30 vouchers. So it'd be like, you know, you were trying to sell that there was $75 to $100 worth of value in the voucher over a 12-month period, but you couldn't use it all at once. But you had to come up with thirty dollars up front, um, yeah, you know, basically to buy the card, and then you get this card, and you could use this, you know, two for one voucher in January, and another one in Feb. And if you used all these things, you could get a hundred dollars worth of value. But you had to eat a lot of pizza or hire a lot of movies, <laughs> like very structured throughout the year. So it was a pretty hard sell. And then you know that commit, we basically get the whole thirty dollars for our company, and then they'd split. I'd get some of that. It was a bit of a pyramid scheme, so I'd have to 
pass some of my profit up the chain. The company would take some, and then basically Domino's and Video Easy would um, would basically get none of it, but they'd get the customer coming yeah. in and, and buying, you know, getting the two for one. So they're yeah. going, hey, we'll give the deal away. We take the thirty and then split it between myself and the company and the uh, other people that were in my team. I love that that's how your story starts because I know what you do now and it's so cool that that's what it was. Did you not want to – when you finished school and throughout your school years, had your dad already started winning appliances and winning group? Yeah, well, it was actually um, started as RW winning in 1906 and they were selling parts for the horse and carriage trade. Wow. And then so that was my great-grandfather. And But, you know, when my dad was in the business, even in the 70s, there were probably only five people in the business. Yeah. So it wasn't – you know, it spent 70 years going from zero to five people. Yeah. It went through, you know, a depression, two world wars, mm -hmm. and then kind of started really only in the 50s and 60s, starting to get some traction after sort of World War Two was over. And then it was, yeah, his dad and his dad's brother. And then my dad went into the business after he, he was a carpenter at first, then went into the business and was doing deliveries and they were doing parts for ovens and stoves and things like that. And then eventually they became a wholesaler a brand called Simpson at the time it was Simpson and Sons and then they lost the dis distribution for that brand and they had these trucks and warehouses and they kind of were like well we're stuffed and then they thought what are we going to do with all these trucks and employees and I mean when I say all these employees they probably had two or three trucks you know it was, mm. but, but to them it was like eight people who were people surviving are relying on, on you. them yeah uh, you know yeah surviving on that salary and they had rents to pay, and so they decided that they were going to become a retailer because there were no other brands that wanted uh, a distributor at the time. So they built a little showroom in the back of the warehouse here at Redfern, and Redfern back then in the 70s or 80s wasn't what it is today. It's kind of cool and trendy now. Back then it was, like, pretty Rough. sketch, yeah, you know. And so to have a, 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 a showroom for appliances and things like that in Redfern back then where your target market was the eastern suburbs, was, uh, you know, a bit of a stretch, but they just did it all on, hey, we've got these um, great products you can't get anywhere else. And they, um, yeah, were the first to sell built-in uh, cooking appliances, first to sell stainless steel appliances, first to sell sort of Smeg and Miller appliances in Sydney. And, yeah, so they were just sort of always that one, the people that were had the first of the latest European products coming out. And so when, you know, people wanted the latest and greatest, that was the place you went. So had it grown in quite a bit by the time you finished school? Like, we was your dad ever like, you should come work for me? Or were you, was that that rebellious part of you? Like, I don't want to just go work for the family business. Well, he sort of gave me an option. He said, look, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. But I want to know at some point. And then I was like, I was happy doing the door-to-door. -door. And then I was doing, um, I was promoting nightclubs uh, in the cross and parties and doing under-18 parties and different things. And I started DJing and... Yeah, I was doing the door-to-door -door stuff during the week and then throwing the parties on the weekend. I was making good money. And so I was like, I'm quite happy. I'm on a good path here, you know, be the next people that are running big festivals like Field Day or something. That was like kind of my vision. And he sort of got the shit to me and sort of said, no, that's not the path that I had planned for you. And I think at one point he sort of said, look, this isn't what I want for my son. I don't want my son to be a DJ working in the, on the weekends and then knocking on doors, mm. you know, midweek and... I was like, well, it's not really your choice, you know. And then at some point I got attacked in Newcastle by a Doberman. I'd, I'd had a couple of close calls with different things, threats and whatever, but this one I was like fully mauled by a Doberman and went to hospital. And at that point my dad got me in a weak spot and was like, is, you know, is this really what you want to be doing? And so I was like, all right, I guess not. And so I quit that job and then he basically said, well, you can get another job, but until you get another job you're coming and work in the family business and then – I never really left. Wow. How big was it when you came to work in it? There's already... It was like six doors, probably, yeah. I mean, it was it was a big, decent-sized yeah. family business. It was probably 50 million turnover or something like that. Yeah. And I uh, can't think... It was only in Sydney, Sydney and Newcastle. And, yeah, I can't think, maybe 100 and 150 employees or something like that. Yeah, cool. So when, how old were you when you went to start working for your dad? I would have been about 19. Okay, cool. Yeah. So let's talk about the transition once you kind of took it into your own hands and did the appliances online side of stuff. What led you to doing that? Well, basically what happened was I was working in that business and my dad really wanted me to get, you know, if I couldn't get a trade, he wanted me to have my truck license. So I was just picking you on, on the um, trolleys, just picking stock. So, you know, grabbing a fridge and putting it on the run from you know, basically getting it out of the racking. 
and then got my forklift license and I could drive a forklift and get the stock that way. And after that, uh, he knew I wanted a car and he said, oh, look, I'll give you a ute, but on two conditions. One, you know, you've got to get your truck license and two, you've got to do deliveries on the way home. I said, okay, that sounds good. So I did that, got this, you know, Ford ute. It wasn't anything too fancy, but it was, you know, as a kid getting your first car, Stark, it's like, yeah, yeah you you know, you think it's the best thing in the world. Yeah. It's like getting a Lamborghini or a Ferrari at that age. You're like, wow, I've got this yeah. Ford, you know, six-cylinder U. This is cool. And um, so I did that. And then from there, I was kind of working on the trucks. I went from the warehouse to the trucks. I was working as an off-sider in the trucks, although I could drive the truck if I needed to because I had my license. And just doing deliveries for a year. And after that, I was kind of getting a bit bored. And I was like, hey, I've got this selling skill. Like, I could sell these products. You know, I've now worked in the warehouse for six to 12 months. I worked on the trucks for 12 months and I went to my dad. I'm like, Hey, put me in the showroom. I can outsell all these people. And he just thought I was a bit eager. So he put me in the um, factory seconds outlet that they had out the back of their main store here at Redfern. And, you know, I sold really well. I was one of the top salespeople there. Then I went in the main showroom and I was sort of selling there. Um, but he didn't trust me selling cooking products cause I'd didn't really cook at the time and I didn't think I'd sort of be able to sell stuff that I didn't understand so I was selling washing machines and fridges and dishwashers as an easier sale and I just noticed lots of customers were coming in with catalogs and saying hey I love winnings I want to buy a few but you know can you you know match this competitor's price on whatever and I was like it seems like something that you know is a bit outdated like why would people just print all this paper and you know just be like basically flogging these in letterboxes and newspapers to people and then you know, get this tiny little picture with only a couple of lines of specifications and it was like right at the time where eBay was starting in Australia. Yeah. And I thought, why don't we put this stuff on eBay and we don't have to do all this printing? And we could sort of, it was a bit David versus Goliath. It's like, you know, the big retailers like your Harvey Norman and your David Jones and, and Retrovision at the time were sort of pushing out these millions of catalogues every week. And what can we do? Like, it's a bit different. Yeah, I was like, we can't afford to do that, but... We can afford to be on eBay and then all of a sudden we've got this national presence and we don't have to keep printing so we've got a real um, a real cost advantage in terms of, you know, they're going to go to print, have design teams and art direction teams and, you know, all, all the extra things, the lag and time of that and then the shelf life of it and then redo it again. Whereas we can put the product up have once, have way more uh, specifications and information on the product and then from there, you know, it lives there for life. And we can have the whole range. We don't have to just limit it to what fits in the catalogue. And so I went and pitched that to my dad and he said, that's a dumb idea. And from there I said, okay, well, if you don't want to do it, why can't I do it? And I'll, you know, do it myself. And he said, sure. And so then as we were looking at it, we worked out that eBay were going to take it too much of a commission and I would sort of rather do things myself than pay someone else to do them. And Where did this mindset of like entrepreneur and like, if it doesn't work, I'll do it my own way come from, do you think? Well, I guess just looking at what they do and, you know, I just was like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, they're going to take 5% or back then it was probably you know 8% or something like that for me to list a bunch of products on their website where I could just build a website and I never have to pay them. And then I'll spend yeah. that money marketing my own website and I've got my own, you know, kind of uh, control over the situation versus I, I never like getting myself in a situation where someone can just go, oh, you're doing really well. The 8% is now 12% and you're mm. kind of stuck. And so I always try and avoid myself getting to like that dead end of the maze. And so it was like, okay, well, let's control our own destiny. So then I decided to build our own website, found some a company in New Zealand that could build it for us pretty cheap. I didn't have the money at the time, so I got a loan off my dad, or actually sort of investment off my dad and winning appliances. And they put 50 grand in. We built the original site. I loaded all the products myself and... We basically started straight away and were profitable because I just had my I had zero costs, you know. Other than the initial website was a cost, it was a tiny bit of software cost, and then the rest was just my and, time. And were you buying off your dad wholesale yeah. and then selling? So to they were basically yeah, just a, well they were our partners. So yeah. it was basically like they owned two thirds of of the business at the time, approximately. And yeah, I was just like getting the stock for free. They were doing the deliveries, but I had to pay for all of that. And then the rest was sort of upside from there. And then our business kind of grew that all the appliance line business is a great story from back in the day when we were young and fun. And, you know, it's just the energy of a startup. There's nothing like it, you know, and we, yeah, we just grew really well. And then eventually got to a point where we kind of grew 
I, I guess, you know, where we were the volume. We took the, the business around the country. We set up warehouses in Melbourne, Queensland, Perth, Adelaide, and eventually sort of the general manager at the time was sort of starting to retire. My dad had already retired in 2005. And then dad sort of said, oh, I want you to run the business, the, the overall business. And then my reaction was, no, I've got my own business. I don't want to run that How business. How old were you then? Uh, that would have been 2011. So I was born in 84, whatever the mass is on that. So I was about 26 or something like that. Yeah. 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 Wow. And so at that point I was like, well, I'm like, my business is flying. I'm really happy. But then I also looked at it and went, well, you're my supply. So, you know, I need the supply. So I yeah. guess I've got no choice but to run the business. Because without them, I didn't survive. So I decided to take it on. I thought it would take two to three years for me to get that business kind of to the position and, and in the shape that I wanted to sort of see it for its future growth. And, yeah, it ended up taking about seven years. So our business, you know, basically just took a big hit. Not a hit. Like, we kept growing. But we were growing 120% plus a year. And then we just started growing like 30% for the next seven years. And so it was still big and was still going well. But it, you know, would have been a lot better if I didn't have to take over the winning appliances business for appliances online. But no regrets. I love the winning appliances business, and they're both now my babies. And mm. you know, we got to take that business nationally. We got that business now to sell bathrooms and furniture and all sorts of homeware products through other brands. And yeah, it's just the two business businesses complement each other a lot. And so, even though I say it, like if I just had an appliances online vision, like yeah, that business got hurt, but. From a group perspective, those seven years working with the winning appliances team and all of the amazing people that we have in that business was like really beneficial to me in learning and, and building what's, you know, a great, you know, a multi-channel experience. We got to take that business online and, uh, you know, last last two years we've won online retailer of the year for appliance online and multi-channel retailer of the year for winning appliances for the online retail of the year award. So... It was, uh, yeah, so both businesses are top of their field in, in what we do, which is really great. Yeah, it's so cool. Like being a pioneer of that online, like selling appliances online is like such a cool thing to know that you guys were the first year in the Southern Hemisphere, I'm pretty sure. To Basically, there were a few people doing like some small little like sort of backyard kind of operation jobs, but not nothing that serious. We are the Scale, first like yeah. decent ones to take it seriously and you know, have our own logistics infrastructure, which we then, you know, started doing third-party logistics. So we've got a logistics company off on the back of that. And, yeah, we're the first ones to you know, really own that end-to-end -end from getting the product to, you know, delivering it to the customer's house with our own trucks. Yeah, and let's talk about appliances online because it's the one thing, obviously, that people, anyone who hasn't bought from appliances online, anyone who has will know it's all about legendary service, which is your guys' tagline. Why was service so important for you to make sure your customers were always happy? Well, I learned that. I, I got that off my dad. So really, um, he, he takes all the credit for that. I came into the business and the, and the business was always looking after customers. And he, from a wholesaler, had five customers. When he went to a retailer, he went, well, I can deal with five customers and keep them happy. But if I go to a retailer, I'm going to have thousands of customers. And he said, so I want to be able to hold my head up high when I walk the streets or go to an airport or someone recognises me. And he said, so we're just going to have to have a model that makes everyone happy and we don't let anyone down. And if we let someone down, then we'd like go a hundred times better to make it up for them. So sometimes our, ha um, our least happy customers at the point of delivery end up being our biggest advocates because we are the first to put our hands up and say, yep, we stuffed that up. We scratched your floor. We chipped your, um, you know, your, your staircase when we're trying to get this big fridge up a narrow stair or whatever it might be that we could possibly go wrong or we were late for the delivery because there was traffic or we missed time something and then we really make that make sure we make that up to them if anyone's unhappy and I just saw the benefit in having that in the business and it feels good to have happy customers I guess you know I, I think about some of the other retailers out there and some of the other businesses that you know might just be like oh I just want to move the boxes I just want to sell the products but you know I know when I go and tell someone that we run appliances online or that I started appliances online that you know almost a hundred percent of the time they're going to say, I love that company. Or mm. I bought off them or my friend loves that company. And if there's a 1% of the time or 0.1% of the time where they don't, the first thing that I say is, okay, how do I fix it for you? You yeah. know, like they're like, if they say, oh, I didn't have a good experience. I'm like, did you tell us about it? Like everyone gets a survey. Like if you let us know, I know we would have caught you and I know we would have fixed it for you. But now I'm here for you and, and I take it on personally and make sure I fix it. And then that customer ends up liking us more than the customer that got a smooth experience in the first instance. 
Yeah, let's talk about that system. So for anyone who hasn't bought from Appliances Online, if you buy a fridge, a dishwasher, anything, you guys come in, you take away the old one, you set it up, you make it perfect yeah. for them. Whereas it's some of the most tedious things ever, having to carry down your stairs or up your apartment block, your new dishwasher that you bought from somewhere else. Appliances Online is all about amazing service. And then, like you said, you've got a system in place that when a customer buys from you, you send out a feedback survey yeah. Do you want to talk about that and how yeah, you rectify sure. if people do have a bit of a complaint? Yeah, so we're sort of one of the best kept secrets, you know, like a lot of these other retailers will like talk about, oh, free delivery for two days only, free delivery for this brand for this weekend. We're like, we're free delivery on everything for the entire country every day. And we don't really, we sort of expect that people yeah. realise that, but most people just assume you're going to charge them delivery. And we, yeah, like you said, free connection. We have installation services we offer, which, you know, for ovens and built-in appliances, free removal, and we recycle all the products that we get back and we recycle all the packaging and remove the packaging. So that's a sort of service. Then we run a net promoter score survey. For those that don't know that, it's that survey you might have uh, had a question from a bank or from somewhere you've dealt with that says, on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely would you be to recommend us to a friend based on your previous experience? And then from that, you basically take all of your zeros to sixes and you assume, and it's all science-based, you assume that people that gave you a zero or a six, so it's sort of an 11 point scale because it includes zero in the one to 10, so zero to 10. Um, so seven of those 11 points you uh, take as a negative. Anyone that, like if they give you a six out of 10, we take that as, as if they've given us a zero. And then um, we've, if they're a seven or an eight, they're passive. So they're likely to say, be passive about their experience. If someone, the theory is if I said to you, hey, you just bought a appliance online, I need to buy a fridge, how was it? Mm, the theory okay. is if you gave us a six, a, like a zero to six, you're probably going to say, I wouldn't use them, don't don't go with them. If you gave us a seven or an eight, you're likely to say, yeah, they're okay, like wouldn't say yes, wouldn't say no. And if you gave us a nine or a ten, then you're what we call a promoter. Mm. And then you'd likely to say, oh, I love them, yeah, you, you know, I'd really recommend them. So then we run that system and, you know, the fundamentals behind it are you get a score so you make sure you're continuously improving and you know where to focus your energy, like which truck drivers have got a better score than others, which states are going better, better score than others, which um, product experts or customer support team members have a better score than others and you can really focus in and give the training to those that need the training. Um, and for us, we, uh, you know, keep that score throughout. But the, uh, we've got a customer experience team and in, I guess in practice, the best part about it is that we actually get the zero to sixes and we call them all. And we're like a whole team of people that don't do any selling to customers. We just call everyone that gave us a zero to six and we're like, what could we have done better? Some people are like, you didn't do anything wrong and we gave you a six. And we're like, yeah, but we take that as, a, as bad, you know, like tell us how we could have done better. And then we just fix whatever the issue is. Whatever stopped them from being a nine or a ten, we say to them like, what would it have taken for us to do to get a nine or a ten? And then whatever their answer is, we're like, okay, well, we'll do that for you. You know, maybe they're like, oh, the guys, you know, maybe they, you know, turned up a bit late. We're like, okay, here's a voucher to use this again. We promise we won't be late next time. We put a mark on their thing. Yeah. We follow it through to make sure the next time they order, we absolutely not late. Or maybe they're, oh, the guys had dirty shoes because it was raining outside and actually they left footprints. Okay, do you want us to send someone around to clean your carpet? You know, wow. we'll send someone around to clean the carpet, that kind of thing. That's just like, it, it's unbelievable to know that. And hopefully anyone who's listening to this now, if they need appliances, go to appliances online, but something else. We are without question the best appliance shop in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I and we won a world agree. retail award for best shopping experience in the world as well. Wow. In 2016. Yeah. Bloody good on you, man. Congratulations. And like you said, coming from no formal education at um, university, none of that. It's just come from you just thinking outside the box a little bit and trying to go after it. Something that I also love about your business is the internals of the business the way that you find your staff, the way that you put your staff in positions and you're backing by neuroscience. You've got neuroscientists in-house to make sure that you're employing the right people for the right jobs. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that and how you've come up with those systems? Yeah, so I just um, find amazing people in my travels that I just decide that I want to work with or do something cool with. And, and sometimes it starts with a problem and I try and find someone to solve that problem. And sometimes I just like find someone that can solve problems I didn't even know I had. Mm. And so the neuroscience example is uh, I was actually at a retail conference called like World Retail or something in Melbourne and this uh, uh, German neuroscientist called Katerina was speaking and I listened to her chat and it just all resonated with me. All of a sudden, all, everything I thought I knew about marketing was just like turbocharged. I was like, oh my God, I thought the digital marketing and measured marketing was everything. Now there's this whole new way of testing and thinking about 
you know, subliminal marketing and the way that colours, you know, your brain interprets colours and that, you know, colours like orange will um, be perceived as cheap and, you know, that red can be perceived as a strong brand but also it can hit the fear centre of your brain because people can relate it to blood but they can also um, perceive red as fast because they can relate it to Ferrari, Mm. you know, and things like that. And so it's, like, interesting to understand how, you know, gold can be premium, black and white can be premium, you know, things like green, you know, tell your brain go ahead. So, you know, if you add to car buttons, things like that. And all of a sudden, you, this whole world of, you know, ways of u- using your communication, your colouring, your, your execution to do some pretty amazing things. I mean, you can use it for real good or you can use it for evil. Um, and, you know, there's obviously lots of examples of people doing it. And maybe what people perceive as good and evil is a whole philosophical question in itself. And maybe the people that I perceive are doing evil think that they're doing good. And so, mm. uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into that debate. But, yeah. you know, we believe we do we do good with it. We use it for the greater good because we believe we have the best service and we believe that we're going to do the best for the customer. We um, do in-house what we call ethical marketing. So we don't do any uh, marketing that's subliminal that a customer doesn't isn't aware of. Um, but we do do things like, oh, make the make this button green instead of orange, and you know, for whatever reason. But we don't try and hide messaging, which is, you know, very possible. Like a, a good example of that would be WhatsApp. Most people on the standard WhatsApp screen, I'm not on WhatsApp because I don't, you know, I don't like some of the way they go to market and the, and the things that they do. But um, if you you, know, you look at the back of the WhatsApp screen, you, you might may not have noticed. You may have been using the app for years, and on the back of the home screen, on the standard screen. If you look behind where the text bubbles are, you'll notice that there's like a, these really lightly defined um, and light contrast sort of like images of kind of octopuses, music notes, slices of cake, donuts, you know, have smiling faces, I pianos. Happy to come to that. Yeah, well. and basically you don't even realize that your brain's processing this, but your your neocortex, your um, limbic system, sorry, your, ne- your neocortex, which sorry, which is your Homo sapien part of your brain, your, your frontal cortex. It processes 10 bits per second. That's what we, we start to sort of rationalise our decision making. But actually your limbic system, which is um, processing, that's like your emotional part of your brain and uh, sort of your monkey brain, so mm. to speak, um, that, uh, that is processing 11 million bits of information per second. So that part's picking up those images and, make, and you are getting a feeling from those images of happiness when you're using that app without your neocortex or your homo sapien part of the brain You'll use that part of the brain now to explain it to you. You'll go and look at that app and you'll use the front, your neocortex to actually look and you'll go, oh, I can see it because you've forced yourself to go into that frontal part of your brain to go, hey, start to pay attention to this stuff and then you'll realise it's there. And only through, you know, sort of studying neuromarketing and, and neuroscience and stuff like that and having those types of people around me that are much smarter than myself have I noticed and started to be able to pick up on these sort of subliminal cues and I think that stuff's sort of a little bit tricky at times. I love that stuff too. I find it so interesting and something that I found really interesting. I did your guys' little five-minute profiling. Yeah, um, the Deep Sphere Yeah, survey. the Deep Sphere. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so Deep Sphere is an amazing product that we've, uh, you know, we've created in-house. And I say we, meaning the team, not, not myself. And that team is basically Katarina herself with a bunch of, you know, amazing support uh, people helping her to get to the, the smarts of where the the product is today she's been working on it for probably 10 years and that's a personality profiling model that we believe is stronger than any other model on the planet and the you know the real secret in the strength is how much information you can get to understanding someone with the minimal amount of information that they give you so from a five minute survey we can get like hours worth of understanding about a a, a person from questions that are super unrelated to what the uh you know, the information that we can feed back to you are. Like we might ask you, you did it yourself, you know, yeah. how do you sleep at night? Mm. And from understanding your answer about that, we can basically put that in a bucket, you know, correlate that with, you know, hundreds of thousands of, you know, scientific points of data research and, and different things. And we can basically say, oh, we know how that person's going to react in this situation or we know how that person's going to feel about this ad or we know how that person's going to feel about this kind of car brand or or a retail brand or we know how that person's going to fit into this team. I mean, that's one of many questions, yeah. but, you know, it's a five-minute survey and we give you a, quite a bit of information. The amount of information that we get is even greater than that. And what we want to use it for is something that's not, you know, to put into the hands of, you know, people that 
are going to do wrong with it, but really to help people understand themselves better to make their best decisions. Mm. And we're sort of very, um, you know, we're very care- cautious that we don't get down the, the Cambridge Analytica path of going, oh, big money's over here. Like we could sway elections or we could push more people into McDonald's or Coca-Cola. Like we'd like... Well, it's not for us to tell people if they like McDonald's or Coca-Cola or want to vote Liberal or Labor. You know, we're like, what we can do is have people best understand themselves to understand why they feel the way that they feel and then help them with tools to be their best self and then they can make the, the best decision for how, you know, how they feel and, and what they want to do. And it's not for us to say, you know, left or right. It's for us to say, hey, maybe you don't even understand why you're choosing left or right. Let's clear that up for you. Mm help you understand yourself better yourself better and the better you understand yourself the better you'll understand why you feel the way you feel and the better you'll make decisions yeah i think it's so cool i think the more we build self-awareness is like the word that comes to my mind once you actually can do a survey that's so quick so easy like i did it before and then came on your guys podcast which i'll try and leave a link in the show notes (laughs) it'll probably come out later but anyway and it was really interesting and it was funny. It, it lined up so perfectly with what I do. And I was like, huh, it was spot on exactly like how I kind of see myself. But your team um, were telling me like, you're obviously a very self-aware, do- like young guy. And I was like, oh, thanks. Yeah, it was quite funny because Kat said to me, she rang me, she was, oh, does Cooper know about the survey? And I said, oh, I, I mentioned to him if he had the link and had, had been sent it. And he said he hadn't. And she goes, well, what else does he know? I'm like, I can't remember if I've told him much about it or what was happening. She goes, is he going to be okay if he walks straight in and I give him the survey? And he said, yeah, he's super open-minded. It doesn't really matter. He'll be, he'll be chill. And then at the end of it, I rang her and she goes, well, you were spot on. He's actually open-minded. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And like it came out in your profile that you're open-minded and easygoing. And obviously those that know you would say, oh, yeah, that does describe <laughs> you well. But I mean, sometimes what, just, what you perceive or put out on the surface isn't actually what's happening internally, mm. but maybe I just you know, felt I knew well enough to know that you were going to say yes, but maybe deep down you might have been nervous and who knows. But the survey said, no, you are legitimately uh, easygoing and, uh, and open-minded. And, yeah, it was, uh, it was quite interesting that the words that I used were exactly what came out in your, in your profile. Uh, it's, you know me pretty well even though. I mean, we've been friends for, I guess, a couple of years now. Yeah, once you get to know someone, you're, you're yeah. pretty easygoing. And then I just as long as they're now. honest and they're, you know what I mean, upfront compared exactly. to what they say. But... I'm going to sidestep now a little bit from business. I want to talk about sailing real quickly before we go to humankind. Sure. I was lucky enough to go out on the Andrew Comanche today, the boat that you won, you captained the, to the Sydney to Hobart. Yeah, I was a skipper, yeah. Skipper. And you've won a few times, haven't you? Uh, we've, I've done it four times and I've won line on as twice. I haven't won it on handicap, um, which is a, you know another first big part lines. of it. Yeah, the first over the line. You're either going for one or the other usually. Yeah. Like you, some boats are made to rate well on handicap and some boats are... You know, just built to be the but fastest. You want to be the but fastest, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't like ocean racing that much, so I, don't, I want to get there as quick as possible. It doesn't matter how long it is. It doesn't matter if I'm racing in New Zealand or America. I'm like, how fast can I get there? And so, um, well, I wouldn't mind winning on a handicap one day. It's like a, it's a real honour as a sailor to have a handicap win as well. But you want to get a line on as one under your belt as well. So in 2016, we won line honours, um, and we broke the record. And this year. I broke that record, which is my PB, but it's not the record because it was broken in 2017. And um, I believe 2017 or 2019. And anyway, and yeah, so for, for me it was yeah really good good to be able to be the skipper and owner and skipper of the boat that, that had won. So I'd won it as one of the helmsmen on a boat that someone else owned, and that was a real honour. But to be able to win it, uh, win line on as, as as an owner skipper was yeah quite good especially when a lot of people <laughs> had said that we didn't know what we were doing that you know our campaign was dangerous that you know we didn't have the skills or the time to put together the team that we we're going to be able to do the you know sail this boat and do this race safely and I think we went you know showed a few people obviously you know still touching wood or whatever because you know the, we're the boat's still in our possession and we want to make sure that we still keep everyone safe and we're very cautious of that but you know, to date, we certainly, uh, I think, showed a few people what we're made of and put a young team together mixed with a little bit of experience on board. Well, a lot of experience amongst a, a few of the crew members, I should say, um, that are very experienced. And we, we all gelled together. It was a kind of a, an odd family of uh, yeah. misfits that, uh, that fitted together really well. And we used Deep Sphere and Helix for that boat to, to really understand each other better. And that's 
one of the things that was was allowing some of this young youth and talent that thinks they know better than and the old youth and uh, sorry the old experience and steady pair of hands that think they know better and bringing out the best in everyone and everyone understanding what each other's strengths are and what each other's like profile for risk is and a few other things and then you sort of go okay now I understand why that person's you know saying the, these things or you know is a bit more cautious in these scenarios and if we want to do those scenarios and I've just got to take the time to explain you know what my thinking is here yeah. before we go into it so we don't scare anyone just understanding your crew it must be so important and like I said I was lucky enough to come out on the boat today and we did I guess like a little race around I you were like oh we're just going to quickly go out on the boat I'm not sure if I'm going to be there or not and then we ended up getting to go out and I had no idea I've been sailing once before with you on the 18 footers which is a whole different experience to what yeah. we did today and what I really noticed and I said this to you on the boat and I said I was going to ask you this on the podcast was the teamwork that's involved in that was something I've never seen before. The way that your whole crew, and it was just kind of a bit of a fun day today. I can imagine once you get to the competitive level, it just changes tenfold. But the way that you guys all communicated and had your jobs and trusted each other with the process while having guests on the boat was pretty special. Do you think the upbringing in the sailing community has led to some positives and vice versa in building a business and building a strong team to have trust in your team? Probably the other way around. I think I probably had a uh, business before I had the sailing teams that were at that kind of scale. So I'd done, you know, I won a world titles in the 29er uh, skiff in about 2001. And that's a two person boat. So I'd sailed a lot of two people boats, a little bit on a three pe person boat on an 18 foot skiff, but nothing with like 24 people, you know, mm. crew that have to really rely on each other. So I think the business kind of got bigger before I was sailing in big teams. So I think I learned more on the business side that I could take to sailing and that leadership part yeah, wow. than it was the other way around. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's really cool. I think that's, um, yeah, just such an interesting take. Because like I said, out there today was just something I've never seen before. So thank you for getting to do that. But something we saw while we were out there on the water was Luna Park. Yeah. Let's talk about cool. humankind. How did you get um, come up with the idea? First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I'm lucky enough to be speaking at the event, getting to share my little spiel but let's um yeah how'd you come up with the idea and then let's talk about what it is you know, firstly thank you for speaking at humankind and it's my absolute pleasure to have you there and you know you were top of the list for for me for friends that i wanted to be involved um it started when i was over watching sal gp in san francisco on the way to go and um see comanche which is now andu comanche and basically do the deal on that boat and i was at a party I was DJing with a bunch of tech friends and one of the people in the crowd was a guy by the name of Matt Mullenweg. They were a bunch of like sort of VC, private equity kind of investors and a bunch of, you know, sort of techie nerds that run businesses and work in businesses and just friends that love go to Burning Man and doing cool stuff. Mm. And um, I got offered to play with a guy by the name of Steve Hoffman who's the uh, co-founder and CEO of Reddit and Matt Mullenweg is the um, founder and CEO of WordPress and my other friend, um, Sophia Lee, who I was there with, she's a founder and CEO of a company called ClearMob. They do a bunch of, you know, cool digital marketing for some of the world's biggest sort of coolest tech companies like Google, Uber, Elon Musk sort of stuff. And so she introduced me to Matt and said to Matt and Steve, you should get to Sydney. And she'd just come back from a trip to Sydney and she said, Herman will look after you. And they were like, yeah, I'd like to go. And Steve said, oh, I'm not sure if I can take the time. He's got a, like loads going on, whereas Matt set his company up where he can re work remotely. It's one of the things that WordPress is super famous for. He's like always never having an office and being a remote workforce. So cool. And so he's like, yeah, I can just get on a plane and work from Sydney. It's easy. So um, Matt was coming and Sophia's like, oh, if you're going to get Matt there, you may as well have him come and talk to your team and give him a bit of a speech. And, you know, he's such an epic icon in the um, – in the tech industry in Silicon Valley, he's a big fa um, believer in open source, um, you know, technologies, and he's got a bunch of very successful businesses and WordPress, you know, probably the most famous one, and WooCommerce, and they host sixty percent of the world's internet content on their platform, approximately, and I think forty-two percent of the world's uh, web internet's websites on their platform. So they're way bigger than people understand, and he's just such a cool dude. Remote workforce like open source platforms so it's like sharing of information sharing of code just like hey here it is and it's a really cool uh, forward thinking way of going about things so matt was like yeah i'd be happy to come talk to your business and then i was sort of like well 
if you're going to come talk to my business, then maybe like this seems like a bit of a waste. You know, it's a thousand people plus, just over a thousand people. And I was like, you know, why don't we get more of Sydney to hear what you've got to say? And my whole business can see it too. And, you know, they can enjoy it. But, you know, a bit of this sharing of information, if that, that's what you're about. And, you know, certainly he, his view is, you know, sh- you know, the more we share, the better we become as a species and a, as a collective community. And so I was like, I'll put this thing on where our team can enjoy it, but other people can enjoy it too. So that's where it started. And I was like, okay, well, I wonder if I could get like, you know, friends of mine, like Wim Hof to come and chat and, you know, build this little event called Wim. Wim's like, if you're doing an event in Sydney and you want me there, I'm there. And I'm like, okay, now I've got Wim Hof and Matt Mullen. Like these are two pretty big heavy hitters. And I was like, oh, it'd be cool to have some entertainment, you know, like I've been to like YPO events, which is like Young President's organisation. It's not really... um something that I'm heavily involved in, but I've been invited as a guest before. I've been invited to join, but I just not, it's not structured the way I like to learn, but I've been to some cool events that they've done where they've had speakers and then they've had like a networking night on a Friday night, um, which is kind of cool. And I got almost as much out of the Friday night networking as I would have the three days or two days of the conference just before. Like school, your dad taught you. Exactly. And so I was like, oh, well, it'd be cool to have like this networking part at the end of the of the summit or the event, and we're calling it an experience, but obviously an experience is yet to be had. But, um, yeah, for us it was, you know, how do, I, how do I make some cool entertainment? So I called my friend Seth Troxler, um, who's, you know, great world-renowned DJ, one of the best in the world, and he said, if you're doing it, I'm there. And I'm like, okay, now I've got one of the world's best DJs, um, certainly one of the world's best health and wellness guys in Wim Hof and one of the world's best business and tech guys in Matt Mullenweg. I'm like, now I've got like this three prong, like health, wellness, business, science, tech, and, um, and then our music, you know, which I wanted to build out each of those categories. So we kept building out the arts. We got this crazy immersive theatre experience we're going to do there. We've got other um, local, um, local musicians like Guy Sebastian, obviously everyone knows, uh, Mickey, there's a band, cool up-and-coming band called The Waddles that are, that are really cool. Then we've got a whole bunch of, like, kind of jazzy bands, like uh, electronic jazzy bands. and Reggie Watts. Yeah, Reggie Watts is there. There's loads more DJs, like DJ Tennis and, um, yeah, DJ Holographic and Tiga, a lot of people would know from back in the day. And, yeah, there's just artists of all types. We've got magicians. We've got comedians like Jim Jeffries. We've got Jenny Johnson. We've got... Uh, Onda Carlo and yeah, a whole a whole bunch of international comedians and Jim, Jim Jeffries, obviously one of the top five comedians in the world at the moment. Someone told me he was rated, and then local comedians are absolute rock star Becky Lucas, uh, you know, old school favorite Vince Sorrenti. So we're really catered to all ages. The oldest ticket buyer at the moment is seventy nine years old. Yeah. The youngest one's eighteen, and the average age is thirty nine. And I think fifty eight percent of the ticket uh, ticket buyers are, are over the age of thirty nine. Wow. So it's quite interesting. But there's a whole group that are like super into this stuff and a whole group that are super into that. And there's really something for everyone. I mean, we've got the whole of Luna Parks. There's like eight venues within the park, plus the rides, plus all this other stuff going on throughout the park, like the immersive theatre. We're going to have live people painting in there. We've got a um, you know, whole imagination factory that's run by AIM that's going to run, showing how they reclaim a whole bunch of like clothing and stuff for their um, hoodie economics and hoodie economy. Um, they're going to be talking about the kindness economy. There's like amazing speakers. Uh, yeah, let's you know. re- rewind just for one second because I know the why behind this is really strong and we've, you're telling us all the amazing stuff that's going to yeah. be there. But I know for you, you've obviously had such great opportunities, built these amazing businesses and network, but you're also very big on trying to give back and make sure that the world benefits from, you know what I mean, getting to see and talk to these people and experience these sort of people. So yeah, what's the whole humankind part of it and why is it so important to to be able to give people the opportunity to meet these people who you've been so lucky to connect with over your lifetime? Well, I think a lot of people talk um, to me and they say, oh, you're so successful. And I'm like, well, I don't know if I rate myself as successful. You know, like, what's success? And they go, well, look at your business, look at your wealth. And we're like, well, I don't rate that as successful. For me, success is happiness. And mm. what I've realised is that, you know, I'm happiest when I'm actually giving back and I'm not trying to uh, like amass wealth. And when I get wealth, I like usually either want to buy something I can share with friends mm. or I want to take friends out to dinner and have a chat or I want to give them an experience that's going on. Or then, you know, as you sort of, you know, we had a pretty good time during COVID as a business and that's where this idea came from. I'm like, oh, here's a chance for me to give back just out 
further than just my friend's circle and my friend's network. And obviously we're like giving as a company and making customers happy and that's all part of business and the way we do it. But for me it was like, how do I give back on a greater scale? And I'd met Jack Manning Bancroft from AIM and just the guy just rocked my world, just completely changed my way of thinking. And my friend Dan Single, who, you know, he's going to be speaking there as well about how he died and came back to life. And, you know, he was a f- co-founder of Subi Jeans and had been a very famous, um, you know, artist and musician played alongside Daft Punk on their Pyramid Tour. Like, you know, he was at the top of the top and then he died. And when he came back to life, he was, you know, in a coma. Then he basically was never going to walk again. Then he learned to walk again and started surfing again. i got to get Dan on the podcast. Yeah, he's got an epic story. And then he just said, you know what? I just realised that, like, what's life about? It's not about building big companies and, like, you know, having fun and, you know, entertaining yourself. It's about, you know, you can get a greater feeling out of more meaningful things and, he got involved with AIM, then he got me involved with AIM, and I'd been on the TV show. And then Let's talk about what AIM show. is real quickly. Oh, yeah. so it's a charity uh, founded by a guy by the name of Jack Manning Bancroft around you know, somewhere around 15 or 20 years ago. And he basically set out to reduce the educational gap for marginalised people. Uh, and it, it, at the time it was kind of marginalised kids and it was very focused on Indigenous kids. And then he's expanded and just done so much more with it. Now it's focused on, you know, all people, all places, all races, all faces kind of vibe. You know, we're in 52 countries. I say we because I feel a part of it, but they're they're the gods that do all the work. You know, they're the amazing legends and I just try and help where I can. And, you know, they're nice enough to help me in return um, with different things that that I do. And so they basically, 52 countries, we've started an imagination factory uh, sorry an imagination university which uh, is like a mentor menteeship program and i'm kind of skipping the story not doing it justice yeah. because because of the time and i could go on for hours about how much i love aim and how much i think that you know these guys are doing great an work amazing charity that's about educating yeah. giving people who don't have the opportunity the opportunity and that's what well, humankind this is. is the funny thing right they they originally looked at it like that and they had this mentor menteeship kind of program and in the end, they thought they were giving back to the people that, that didn't have the opportunity. And actually, more often than not, the mentors were coming back going, I got more out of that kid than that kid got out of me. Mm. And so they've totally flipped the switch on, uh, uh, on the way of thinking about it. And they're like, no, this isn't like someone inside the margins giving back to someone outside of the margins. This is actually about people sharing knowledge and saying, well, you've been alive for 20 years and you've got this way of thinking and I've been alive for 40 years and I've got my way of thinking. Let's tell some stories. Let's understand each other's experience and let's learn from each other. And it's basically about building these unlikely connections of five and using a network that's based on the mycelium network to basically what Jack calls the incy wincy spider approach of like of knowledge sharing um, to, you know, build different ways of thinking and, and hopefully break the mould of you know, the way that the system works and, and break down. It's not about um, sort of, I don't want to put words in the mouth, but it's really not about like breaking down an empire or breaking down the walls of the way society works, but just improving it day by day by understanding, okay, those that are inside of the margins and that's, that could be perceived as like privileged and get a great education and, you know, have food on the table and good health care and all that stuff, and mixing them with people that are outside of the margins that might be less fortunate depending on what your definition of fortunate is. Um, and then actually understanding those connections that happen and those light bulb moments when someone inside the margin goes, oh, I thought you were less fortunate than me, but actually I think I'm less fortunate than you because you've been brought up on love and you've been brought up on experiences and you've got all these like cool stories that you're telling me that I've never had any of that. I've gone through wow. this kind of regimented system that's got me to being wealthy and driving a Mercedes and having a family and having kids and bu- buying a house on the waterfront, but actually you're smiling every day and I seem fucking miserable. Mm. Um, pardon my French. But okay. um, yeah, and so basically it's really uh, having those moments and then putting those people together to, to see what, uh, what magic comes of it with real no, really no plan other than the plan is build the unlikely connections and l- let's see where this grows to. Yeah, it's such an amazing organisation and that's what humankind is all the profits are going to. Yeah, it's a non-for-profit event. Yeah. So all the ticket sales and the funding. The sponsors, that, everything. Yeah, yeah. Everything so basically comes. I take all the risk and they take all the profits. And, well, you're a good um, man. Yeah. And so well, that, that's a great, yeah, it's a great initiative. And I, you know, I'd never met anyone in my life that I thought that could do better with a dollar than myself. And that's egotistical, obviously, in any 
entrepreneur or good business person or competitive sports person will tell you the Can't same. Like, have that mindset. You know, it's like if you're a professional surfer, you go like, you give me an hour of training on a new board, then I reckon I'm going to do better with that hour of yeah. training than the next person. Or, you know, I used to think, oh, you give me a dollar, depends. And like our business isn't um, built to kind of just, you know, build this massive empire and keep all the money and knowledge to ourselves. You know, we're like kind of like, hey, how do we share experiences yeah. with people and, and do some cool stuff? And... I honestly used to think like, oh, if I wanted to change the world in this way or that way, and I wasn't sure how I was going to change it or what I was going to change, but I used to say, hey, give me a problem and I'll solve it better than anyone. And me solving it wasn't necessarily doing it myself. I know in my head, my shortcut in life is finding the people and motivating them to solve that problem with me. So I'm like, oh, you got the you got a math problem? I got the best math guy you know. Oh, you got a neuroscience problem? I got the best neuroscientist that I know. Oh, you got a sales problem and you need to like sell a bunch of things? Like I got the best sales team in my network, you know? And I just was always about building this network of really cool people that could do really cool things and wanted to have each other's backs. And in the end, I met Jack and I was like, oh my God, I think I've been outdone. Like I actually think you'll do better in the world with my money than I would do myself. Wow. And so now as I, you know, kind of build wealth and look after my family and, and do all of those things, any excess, I'm kind of like, how do I funnel that to aim and to Jack? Because, you know, I think that they're, what they're doing is just incredible. And so we've sort of planned humankind to go for 10 years because AIM's got a 10 year strategy and then they're going to kill, kill themselves off. They're the first organization with a planned death in their, no. in their business plan. So he said that was the toughest board meeting he had was convincing the other um, board members that he wanted to kill the kill the charity off uh, after ten more years. So I think it'll see him almost three decades in in operation. But he said, yeah. "Look, things don't live forever." And in the indigenous way of thinking, and Jack's half indigenous, and you know he grew up with the the best of both worlds. You know, a great education in the modern day world of like you know your kind of MIT labs and Harvard University and Sydney University and all that kind of way of thinking of textbook way of thinking, but also on the other side of his family, you know, this 60,000 years of indigenous Dream systems time, thinking and knowledge and, you know, so he's, he's seen the best of both. And he said, look, the indigenous way is like nothing should live forever. If it lives forever, it'll start becoming toxic and, you know, bureaucratic and political and, mm. and actually like we're better off just inspiring the world for a period of time. Everyone runs at a deadline. We have a goal. We hit that goal. We can all celebrate and say our work here is done. Go and move on to our next thing and hopefully that'll be like almost like planting a whole bunch of new seeds and then it, it blossoming from there. So amazing, man. It's so cool to have that sort of humbleness to be like, yeah, he can do better with it. And I, and I want to go back to humankind quickly because our aim is amazing, but this humankind event is all, all the funds are going to it, but the event itself is something that I think is truly going to really inspire some people to make some positive changes. So let's talk about the three-day event. So it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yep. 16, 17, 18. Yeah, 16, 17, 18 of, of this March. month. Yeah, so it's coming up very less soon. Less than two weeks by the time this podcast is out. Yeah, yeah. So I want to just sort of encourage people to come along. So who are the sort of audience? You said the average age is 39, but the way I think about it, this is something that... We don't look at any... like uh, we, No, 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 sorry. But uh, the way I look at it, I feel like my 20 to 30 should be the ones who are like, I want to come to this event. So let's talk about... So Thursday, we're going to rock up. You've got speakers all day in categories yeah. from health, wellness to Wim Hof breath work sessions. Uh, I'll be speaking that day. I think, you know, we've got a bunch of you know, a bunch of business leaders. We've got people that run charities and do amazing good work. We've got a, a lady by the name of uh, Candice Mama. And she was rated as one of the, um, I think, one of the most influential people in Africa. She's one of the co-CEOs of AIM. And she's coming out to tell her story of, like, when she was a young girl, her dad was uh, murdered and she convinced her family to go, I think, almost 20 years later after she'd, and I, I hate to put words in her mouth, I haven't heard the story from her own words, but basically she'd convinced um, her family to go and meet face-to-face their, her father's murderer almost 15 or 20 years after he'd been murdered and she'd lived with this hatred in her in her belly and then they went there and for, heard his story and forgave him in, in the prison where he was doing obviously a wow. life sentence for murdering her dad and she said at that moment she had a light bulb moment and she's um you know got this idea for a kindness economy and how we can all be nicer to each other and feel better uh, and better understand each other I guess and I'm I'm telling the story like I know it, but I'm waiting to hear it. I've heard yeah. it third hand, and, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing her speak myself. I've met her and sh- shook her hand without knowing her story and seen her at AIM. 
And then, um, you know, when we were looking for speakers, someone said, yo, Candace has an amazing story. And not only that story, but she's got this amazing concept for a kindness economy and Jack's fully on board with it. And they're going to pitch, um, kind of pitch that uh, story as well. So she's speaking. Sounds very up my alley. It's yeah. seriously like just as the most inspirational moving human beings you could possibly think of that so, are going to be there. Yeah. So it's like speakers during the day. First night's comedy show with Jim Jeffries and all the comedians. Yeah, and there'll be some other stuff going yeah. on at the same time. The rides are going. So. Yeah, I want to talk about that. So you've got the Ferris Wheel of Fortune going. And I heard you were going to get like VCs from your friends of yours who have got money potentially yeah. if they want to VCs, be. mentors, like yeah. people like maybe you'll jump in there yeah. and say to someone might say, hey, I want to, you know, pitch this idea to Cooper or hear his story and, you know, have a chat. But it's like, again, building unlikely connections of people that wouldn't otherwise get to sit in a Ferris Wheel carousel one-on-one with someone who who's their, maybe their idol or someone yeah. that could give them a lot of business, like leg up either financially or through advice. And they can sit there for, you know, a three to five minute loop of the Ferris wheel and basically go, hey, I got this idea. What do you think? Mm. And super casually get that feedback of an, like an elevator pitch, but it's a long elevator pitch and get that, uh, that feedback loop from that person on what they think of the idea and possibly even get handed a business card and go, hey, I'll, I'm actually going to, Shark Tank this idea and yeah. uh, and give you some funding. See, I think it's so cool. I think you're basically creating the opportunity for others that maybe you've had throughout your life to put yourself in a room and have that opportunity to actually, yeah, connect with somebody who you might not ever be able to connect with. Like this is what this event is all about, bringing people together to raise the consciousness of the world. So if anyone's out there and they want to get tickets, there's still a bunch on sale. I yeah, know there's a pretty cool thing going on with the tickets. So if you like the VIKP I, and stuff, yeah. Yeah, we've got a, uh, yeah, well the website's www.humankind.sydney and um, yeah, the tickets are $99 for a day ticket at the moment. They might go up as, as they start to sell more and $199 for a three day ticket at the moment. And you can get um, like a lot of people say, Oh, I want a guaranteed seat to watch Jim Jeffries. I want to go and meet Wim Hof and do an ice bath with Wim. You can buy a platinum ticket. It's eight hundred dollars for three days, or there's a gold ticket that I think uh, is about two hundred ninety nine dollars for a day, um, where you basically got guaranteed seating for all the biggest headline acts. Otherwise, it's only first come first service. Things rotate, but there's eight rooms of speakers, and there's epic speakers in all over the place. But if you've got someone specifically you definitely want to go see, you either just get there early and go and get a seat and wait for them to speak, or or you buy, um, you know, the gold or platinum ticket and then you'll have a reserved seat for all the stuff that you want to see specifically. And I, I think my audience is perfect for this. So if you're in Sydney and you're into self-development, you're into opening your mind to new things, you're into networking and you aren't coming to this event, I highly, highly encourage you to get a ticket because this yeah. is like a once-in-a-lifetime once opportunity. Wim Hof's going to be there, Ned Brockman speaking. Yeah, it's crazy. We've got Hattie Boyd or we've got uh, Sarah Ellen, we've got... Uh, Ronnie Khan, we've got Professor Scott Galloway uh, from the US is doing a live stream in and, um, you know, uh, personal Q&A. Obviously, Matt Mullenweg, CEO of WordPress. I mean, you know, so yourself, Alex Pete. Hayes, yeah, yeah. myself. I mean, it's, it's an endless Teo. list of, yeah, uh, Jonathan Teo. We've got uh, Dr. Michael Chagru, who um, who Dr. Charlie Teo says is the most likely person to cure cancer, wow. in his opinion. He's going to be uh, live linking in there. They're the only two uh, live linking from America. And then everyone else is there face to face in person. Like Wim Hof's there in person. Jimmy Jeffries, like everyone else. Just so Dr. Cool. Mike Chagru. And, you uh, do ice baths with Wim as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Me personally, or no, you at the event, you can, there's gonna yeah, be ice baths yeah, yeah. to do one with Wim. So I make mean, sure you bring your board shorts or your swimmers if you're, yeah, exactly. Coming. Bring, bring all that stuff and uh, get ready to get in the ice. And yeah. Wim will be there, and he's gonna have um, a bunch of his certified trainers there. I think Tommy Burgess, rugby league player, he's gonna be there, um, because he's a big Wim Hof fan, and I'm they do a lot of, Hoff. yeah, they I do a lot to him of stuff every morning. I'm like, it's gonna be weird seeing him in person yeah. and meeting him. I can't wait. So, Tommy's done lots of ice baths, so he's gonna be assisting as well with the ice bars with Nigel Beach, who's like a mental coach and uh, works with the All Blacks, and he's you know, obviously very close and a certified Wim Hof trainer. Um, there's just, yeah, there's going to be a whole bunch of people trying to get as many people through the ice as possible. That'll be on the Friday breath work on the Thursday. Pretty much everyone should be, um, able to get a seat to anything that they want to go to. You know, we try to plan it out whether, you know, the popular stuff is in the bigger rooms and then the other stuff, but all the rooms are quite big. Yeah. We've definitely built it with a lot of room to breathe. So we, you know, it's not congested and people can sit down and get all the experiences that they want. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be quite epic. I think it's, it's like literally going to like a music festival, but instead of, I mean, there is a music and festival music element, at, yeah, but it's like going to well. a music festival with this huge lineup of just incredibly inspiring people that you can go and learn from. It's like, 
I'm so excited for it. Well, it's the best of everything. You know, I love going to all, because I'm a DJ as well. So, you know, gone and played Glastonbury and Burning Man and done all these other things around the world. And I'm just taking the best of what I've seen it, like the Burning Mm. Man community and vibe and, you know, that sharing of knowledge and ideas and, you know, the whole fact that it's not a music festival, it's not an arts festival, it's not an experience, it's just a whole, it's its own beast. And so we just tried to create something that was unlike everything else, but took the best of everything that I've seen from, you know, your TED Talks or your pub cons in Vegas, which is like your neuromarketing world forums and, you know, all of the best of like the business knowledge and science learning stuff that I've done with all the best of like the music and fun stuff and the art stuff and the community stuff and, and really trying to yeah. try to blend that into like three days of kind of, we we're going to originally call it work hard, play hard, but not, not specifically, we we're going to call it WHPH standing for work hard, play hard. But then we thought, you know, we could do better than that. So we came up with humankind, but the idea is like, Hey, you know, from nine to five Thursday, Friday, like, you know, we are corporate friendly. We are about like being serious. Like I've got a whole team here. I don't let them go on and just drink beers and yeah. wine and in the middle of the day. It's okay. We've got work yeah. to be done. But 5 p.m. on a Friday, we're cracking beers open and we're having fun together because, you know, you've got to be able to enjoy that time with your, with your colleagues as well and, you know, you know, have that relax and that celebration of your wins and what you've achieved throughout the week. So it's really about, you know, Thursday night, go there, 9 to 5, l- listen, learn. You know, there'll be workshops on, you know, biohacking your sleep, meditation, um, yoga, sound healing, all that stuff if you want to do that to, like for bettering your, your personal well-being. Um, right through to all the, the stimulation and learning stuff. And then at 5 p.m., we're kind of like, okay, cool. Now it's the end of the workday. Enjoy like the, this epic world-class comedy event, you know, with a bunch of other magic and other stuff going on around and the rides and like you can network and have fun. But then Friday, we're back into it, you know, 9 a.m. or even early, maybe 8.30 a.m. on Friday. We go uh, right through again till 5 p.m. Uh, maybe some of the talks have been going as late as 6 p.m. in some of the rooms. And then again, 5, 6 p.m., okay, now the bar's open, there's going to be some live bands, some live music, some, you know, again, magic stuff. And, like, the, this every night we've got this immersive theatre that's happening, um, that's being uh, designed. I don't want to give too much away, but it's going to be this epic experience for what we're calling um, some of our uh, select VIKPs, which is our very important kind people. So people will be able to nominate their friends for acts of kindness or nominate themselves for things that they've done that are kind. We'll pick 100 people... Uh, I think we're doing two to three sessions a night. So we do two to 300 people per night across the three nights. And they'll be able to take part in this like amazing once in a lifetime, like epic immersive theater experience. So that'll be going on at night as well. And then on Saturday, it's a full networking day, you know, uh, go home, rest, come back and then enjoy, you know, there's um, still starting off with some meditation, some sound healing, some feel good stuff for your body. Like, uh, and then a bit of educational stuff more uh, on the personal level than like the business and the business and science side of things. And then we get into like in the afternoon and the evening, we get into more entertainment stuff and, you know, enjoy Luna Park in all its glory and, and have some fun and have a dance next to Wim Hof and all of your, mm-hmm. you know, your favorite mentors that you've heard talk over the few days before and tell them your story because they're all ears and they're super excited to hear from our community as much as we're excited to hear from them. It's, man, if you're anywhere in Australia, anywhere in the world, and you can get to Sydney for those three days, like it costs ninety nine dollars to go to Luna Park for the day anyway, and yeah. you get all of this included. Like it's yeah, it's all free rides for the days. Yeah. I mean, I think Luna Park's around nine nine dollars for a day ticket anyway to use all the rides. So you get all the rides plus all this stuff. And really, the way that the, the value's been able to be created is through you know the help of all of our sponsors, and we've we've raised a lot of sponsor money from a lot of corporates and a lot of you know very uh, amazing families and high net worth individuals that want to see this event succeed and they've kind of put in the money to subsidize a lot of these um these tickets and these costs to make this event possible at such an affordable rate because we want it you know it's about reducing the educational gap for for those that are marginalized that's that's really where aim started and so for us it was like we don't want to price this out of the market and have something that like the people that we really want to um to attend this not be able to to attend and the other thing is we are actually giving away free tickets that people are sponsoring so we've got a whole bunch of people that are um, basically donating what we call our VIKP tickets separate to the immersive theatre thing they're calling them both VIKP but basically for those that are not able to afford you know even a $99 ticket maybe because they're spending 60 hours a week nursing their sick mom or dad or you know doing like palliative care work kind of vibe 
or maybe they're a nurse that's just worked like absolutely long hours all through COVID for three years and barely paid their rent and their more or their mortgage is going up or the cost of living and they aren't able to do that. And people, friends can nominate them for a free ticket saying, hey, my friend does, does this act of kindness. This is the hours that they put in every week and this is the reason that they deserve a free ticket to humankind. And there will be a, a sponsor behind that that we've already prearranged that's bought packs of tickets to go uh, to these kind people and so we're giving out a thousand free um, free tickets to VIKPs, which are people that have done acts of kindness and put hours and hours of, of kindness into the world and the economy with nothing given back. And this is a way of what we're calling the, the universe giving back to them in, in a little way. How can people nominate for that? I uh, go onto the website. I think it goes live tonight. Okay. And um, there'll it'll be a be link the for VIKP. This. Yeah, it'll be yeah it'll be up by, sun- by Sunday whenever this goes up. Well, man, this um this event is going to be something so spectacular. I, I cannot wait. I don't even know how long we've been chatting for, but this has <laughs> been so fun. Today's just been epic. Coming to catch up with you and getting to... My pleasure. Yeah, just learn all about the event. Learn a bit more about your story. You're somebody who truly inspires me, not only with your business acumen, but also the way you treat people, the way you're trying to give back. And over our couple of years of friendship, you've done a lot for me. And I, I'm super appreciative. And I, I'll finish with one quick little story. It's really funny. I think I might have told you this, but... A couple of years ago, probably a year before I met you, my dad sits there every night and watches different news and whatnot. And there was one day that I remember so clearly, he put on an interview that you had with somebody on like a nightly news thing about business and about the way you treat your employees and about, I think it was, I can't remember fully what the story was about, but I remember it so clearly. My dad was like, this John winning guy is a bloody legend. If you can meet him one day and like get to know him, he's a good dude. And then just the universe somehow <laughs> landed us together and here we are. So I know How my funny. dad will be listening and he said he's very excited to meet you at Human well, Hey dad, yeah. look forward to seeing you. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's, he's awesome. very excited to meet you. So that's just a funny little story, but I'm going to leave in the show notes, everything to get involved. Humankind, please make your way down there. Come and see me. If you bought a ticket, because if you heard this podcast, come say hi to me. I'm going to be floating around the whole time. I'll be floating around too. And there's people coming from all over the world. Yeah. If you hear a different accent, have a chat to them. Because I guarantee you they're interesting people. We've got people coming from Europe, um, the UK, all over America, Asia. People are flying in New Zealand from, from literally all over. We've got like oh. people just to attend the event because they've, they've seen what it is. And I know, you know, a handful of those people that are coming and they're, they're not, uh, they're not unsuccessful people in their own right, whatever their fields are. So if you hear a different accent, ask them their story because I, pr- I promise you 99 times out of 100 or more, they will have an epic story. Mate, well, this has been an incredible chat. I finished Good Humans podcast with the same question for every single guest and I'm going to ask you as well. So good. what does being a good human mean to John Winning Jr.? I think for me, being a good human is um, – doing the things that, uh, you know, give you good results back from the universe. And I think it's uh, really comes down to karma. It's something that's hard to be defined. But I know that whenever I'm doing something that feels wrong to me, I usually have a bit of bad karma. And whenever I'm doing something that feels right to me, I generally have good karma. Mm-hmm. I go with the, uh, with the waves of energy that I, I, um, that, that I feel around me and I go generally with my gut feeling what feels right and if I can't make a decision then I generally say what feels right in my gut you know maybe I'm overthinking it and I go with my gut feel and you know generally if you've had a a pretty good upbringing and you've surrounded yourself with good people um, in your life and you'll make the right decisions and I know even if that hasn't been the case generally I think when you do the right thing then the universe gives back and I'm yet to find someone that seems super happy and super successful in whatever their definition of success is that doesn't tell me that they believe that the universe gives back to them when they do good. So I think, you know, feel the universe, take the time to take the space and, you know, meditate or, or, or slow yourself down, make some decisions and try and understand when you, you feel like you're getting that good karma back. And I think if you're getting the good karma back, then you're a good human. Right. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. I would shake your hand. I've got a sweaty hand. <laughs> no, thank man. you so much. This we turned been... the aircon off for those <laughs> so we weren't making the noise in the microphone, but uh, it is hot in here, but that's but, good. Hey, thank you. I know you're a very busy man and it's um, been an absolute pleasure to have a chat. Thanks for jumping on Good Humans. My pleasure. Cheers. Sick.